All right, we're recording. I want to welcome everybody today to our May uh, 2023 Eurisa Texas Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Brian King. I'm co-hosting with Ollie Powers today, and uh, we've got a really, really great presentation for you today. We have uh, Dr. Michael uh, Goodchild, uh, Emeritus uh, Professor of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, um, uh, Dr. Goodchild is going to give us a, a presentation on um, the uh, geoethics, and so we're really excited about this one today. Uh, it will be recorded, uh, as you heard. It'll be on our YouTube channel afterwards. So, uh, Dr. Goodchild, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, and uh, thank you again for, for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thanks for the invitation to do this and for the introduction, and uh, thank you for attending. Um, I guess attending is the right word when, when we're Zooming, but uh, I guess uh, I do wish we were face-to-face, -face, but of course, it's, uh, we're taking advantage here of technology, and hopefully it, it'll work out well. Uh, I want to talk about a project that has been in existence now for uh, going on three years, um, which is called Geoethics, and it's a um, project uh, jointly sponsored by ESRI, um, the American Association of Geographers, and UC Santa Barbara. And I'm the co-chair of the organizing committee. And here's uh, just a quick um, view of the international group that is, uh, has been organizing this project. Um, and I want to talk today about some of the things that have emerged from this project. So. Um, first and foremost, perhaps why now? Why worry uh, about ethics and why in particular is ethics a, uh, oh, a, a very significant topic right now at this point in history? And I think there are several reasons for this. One is a growing concern, I think, about the potential of geotechnology for privacy and surveillance. I think uh, there is a lot to be learned there by looking across different countries and how they have approached this uh, issue. Um, and I'll talk some about that in this, in this presentation. Then there's a broader issue in science, which is the issue of replicability and reproducibility, which unfortunately is two very long words. Um, so we like to shorten it to R&R. &R. And uh, R and R is a, a a trend in science where people have gone back to accepted results from the past, published results, and tried to replicate them, confirm that the conclusions are correct. And unfortunately, in uh, numerous cases, that has turned out to be problematic. Um, this arose largely, I think, in experimental psychology, where <clears throat> a lot of conclusions over the past few decades have been questioned um, because people have been unable to repeat the, the conclusions. Um, it's a question, I think, an uh, open question as to the extent to which this applies in the geosphere. Um, but there are several active research projects investigating that question. To what extent is replicability an issue in, in uh, the geosciences? Then I, I want to talk particularly today about this issue of making inferences from GIS analysis and geodata. And the fact that along that particular path, there are numerous potential pitfalls. Um, issues of making incorrect inferences jumping to the wrong conclusions, if you like. And it seems, and um, I guess the, the uh, evidence is very strong, that in this geospatial field, um, this is particularly hazardous. So I'll have several examples of that as, as we go through this. And then there's the general question of diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI which is a general trend uh, across um, human society. And um, the question of the extent to which that is, is a, uh, a major issue in the geospatial uh, field. I wanna talk briefly about that question. 
And then <clears throat> the last and perhaps the hottest topic right now is the concern about ethical issues that are raised by artificial intelligence. And again, I'll, I'll talk somewhat about that. So as you can see from this, this is potentially a vast canvas and many groups are engaged in discussions and trying to move forward on the ethical issues. And one in particular is, is ERISA, which has a code of ethics dating from 2003, which is, I think, still a very useful document. Um, it's concerned with obligations of people working in the field to four different groups, society, employers, funders, colleagues, the profession, individuals, and society. And then the American Geographical Society has an active project called Ethical Geo. And it has produced something that I think is, is very useful. It's almost in the way of a checklist, the issues that one might consider in thinking about a project. And here they are, and I won't attempt to read them, um, <clears throat> but you might like to go to this <clears throat> uh, document, excuse me, <clears throat> document which is readily accessible. It's known as the Lotus uh, Locust Charter. And here are the 10 headings under that, uh, under that charter. So a vast canvas, how to prioritize it, how to decide what to work on, what issues are most important. And so <clears throat> our project, the Geoethics Project, held a series of webinars, uh, seven of them, in the um, last couple of years. And these culminated in a face-to-face -face meeting, a summit in Santa Barbara, um, June, of 20, uh, June 27 to 29 of 2022. And that summit lasted for three days and produced a uh, what we're calling a white paper, which is, I think, a, a very comprehensive um, summary of the, the issues. There are four subtopics in it. Uh, one is a research agenda, because the question we asked was, what do we still not know about ethical issues and what research would be helpful? in moving forward a concern for ethical issues. And then there was education and training and the regulatory environment at federal, state, and, and in fact, international levels. And then the question of um, <clears throat> groups that have been traditionally underrepresented in the GI, in the GI sciences, um, <clears throat> and particularly um, indigenous stakeholders, non-traditional stakeholders and how to reach out to them. Uh, all of this came together in a report. Um, it, it's 23,000 words, and I wouldn't recommend that anyone read it from beginning to end. Um, there is a quick start guide on this at the same website, um, which was designed to be helpful to people who want to introduce discussions of ethics into, into courses. And um, <clears throat> What was most remarkable to me about this, I think, is that <clears throat> the attendees at this workshop produced 23,000 words during those three days. I've never seen anything like that. I've always assumed that you have, you spend three days discussing and then somebody gets to, to assemble the report later. Um, but this report was actually assembled during the, during the workshop. Um, so, Today, I want to talk about just a subset of these issues, and um, clearly the, the number one, the one that we always think about first when it comes to ethics and um, GIS is the geoprivacy issue, the extent to which um, privacy is being invaded, um, the use of the technology for surveillance, and, and so on. And I'll talk about that. And then I want to talk about this issue, which is very central to my own interests and concerns, which is the question of making inference from spatial analytics. So we analyze geospatial data. We attempt to make inferences from them. What are the hazards? What are the ethical issues involved? How can we be more ethical in the way we make inferences? 
And then <clears throat> I want to talk somewhat about this issue of replicability, or if you like, uh, generalizing across space and time. To what extent is what we discover using GIS about a particular area at a particular time, to what extent is it uh, generalizable to other areas and other times? And that I think is, is a significant ethical issue which locks into the broader concern in science over replicability and reproducibility. Then I want to talk about uncertainty. And then the issue that to me um, came out of this summit and the earlier webinars that I was most surprised by, but really became for me a, uh, a very key issue in considering ethics in GI science. And that's the question of repurposing. And so I want to talk about that a little. And so that's an outline of, of today and uh, the next, well, now about uh, 30 minutes. So here's a very early example. This is dated from 2003 of the concern about privacy and uh, surveillance. Um, this is a news story from South Carolina. And it concerns an SUV that was parked on the roadside. And if you look carefully, you can see dangling under the SUV a wire. And the person who parked the SUV and went, uh, came out of the business, um, <clears throat> looked at the car and said, oh my God, there's a, a wire dangling from my car. Called 911, a robot, was dispatched, which you can see this, the area was cleared um, and the robot went in and discovered that what was stuck on the car was a GPS tracking device, not a bomb. And if we updated this 20 years later, of course, um, the tracking device these days would be so small that it could be easily hidden. There'd be no question of a telltale wire dangling under the vehicle. So a very early example of the use of geospatial technology and the privacy question. Here's a, a rather um, interesting, I think, and, and very powerful example of what can happen. This is the work of Andrew Curtis when he was at Louisiana State. And it's a map of, Los An uh, map of uh, New Orleans uh, following the Katrina um, event. And the red dots are the locations of deaths um, due to Katrina. And that information, of course, is fairly private and sensitive. Um, but the local newspaper, the Times Picayune, went ahead and published this map. And <clears throat> their argument, I'm sure, would be that the accuracy of the map is not sufficient to identify the house uh, where the red dot where the death occurred. However, they also included on the map the census tract boundaries. And by mapping the, by, uh, by overlaying the census tract boundaries on the map, it was possible to warp the map to something very much more accurate than it would otherwise be. And to identify, Andrew was able to identify in, I believe, 60% of the cases exactly which building the death occurred in. So the message here is the power of GIS technology, especially when you combine different sources of, of data, um, the power of GIS technology to invade privacy. Um, here's an example from the New York Times. This was in 2018. And this is the result of the Times obtaining, and they were never clear about how they obtained, but obtaining 300 million pings. In other words, uh, records of uh, location and time. And what has happened here is those pings have been selected for a particular device. Um, the pings were anonymized, there were no names, but at the same time, the device was identified. And by combining, linking together all the pings for one device, we can reconstruct the travel of that person or the owner of the device. And um, 
it then becomes a no-brainer to figure out who this person was, where this person lives, where this person goes to see the doctor, where this person, and, and therefore what um, complaint the person possibly has, and all sorts of confidential information about the person. New York Times was able to uh, get agreement from the person to allow this information to be published and the person to be identified and publish the location of the house. Um, notice, however, that that's a single family house. And if it had been an apartment building or even a townhouse complex, um, the accuracy of the, G of the location would not have been sufficient to pin down the identity of the person. So we are looking at what a 40% probability of being able to identify the person from this kind of data. Um, here is uh, some mm, um, information, advertising information for one of the companies involved in this business. And what I have to, to say is that at this point, many apps which you download to your iPhone or your um, mm, uh, other smartphone, um, many of the apps will capture the locations of the user. Um, you will, of course, have agreed to the terms and conditions of the use, but you probably did not read through the 90 pages or 100 pages of, of the terms and conditions. And there has developed a, a very significant industry involving tens of companies that capture this information, aggregate it, and repurpose it and sell it on to marketing um, companies. So in this case, this is the weather company. This is actually owned by IBM, uh, which is marketing data obtained from apps to a variety of, of uh, companies and describing the uh, data that they're selling as being, quote, uber precise and accurate, a claiming accuracy to one meter. Now, anyone who knows GPS and the kind of GPS that's available on an iPhone knows that that one meter accuracy is a very significant stretch. Um, so we're not talking about, um, as, as in the previous example, we had, uh, we'd identified an individual uh, and, and a house, but only because that house was a large single family house. So there is an accuracy issue running through all of this. And here's just an illustration from Twitter. These are uh, geocoded tweets, the red dots. This is the work of Lena Lee when she was a student of mine. And you can see that this person tweets a lot from uh, locations on the map. Um, but it will be very difficult, I think, to figure out which house this person actually occupies and um, uh, pin, pin this down, therefore, to a single individual. And here's uh, a track that I generated in Strava when I was walking home one evening in Chicago. This is in, in the Loop, downtown Chicago. And this is simply illustrating the kind of distortion that you get uh, in GPS from an iPhone GPS that's being used in an area with very tall buildings. So <clears throat> good luck with trying to uh, identify exactly what I was doing. Uh, I was simply walking straight home, but it looks like I was doing something much more complicated. Um, one area of regulation that has moved forward in this field um, unusually uh, is HIPAA. And this governs what we can do with health data. So this is a segue for me into talking about health data. So in terms of privacy and ethics, HIPAA, quote, intends to balance an individual's interest in keeping his or her information confidential with social, uh, social benefits, including healthcare research. So to what extent should we be aware of the locations of people in order to conduct research? And that's the, the central question here. And HIPAA, you may know, um, goes, I think, overboard in this area. 
by specifying 18 variables, which might be used to determine location and invade privacy, and therefore must be suppressed. And this, of course, begins with name and address, but it goes on to images, because these days images can be matched to databases. And um, so it's, it's very rigorous, I think, in, in protecting privacy. And so what we're left with is two possibilities. Uh, we can protect privacy by, and in, in the case of health records, by aggregating health records to, for example, counties or census tracts, or by masking locations by distorting them deliberately. So we can aggregate the zones, or we can replace locations with randomly generated locations. And each of these has its own impacts on research. So to decide which of these to use, we need to know what the research question is. Some research questions would be severely jeopardized by distorting locations, and others would be distorted by, would be jeopardized by, by, this, by aggregating data. So the basic ethical question then is this, what types of analysis are best enabled using aggregation versus masking. And if the distance between cases is important, so if it's some question you're trying to address by knowing, by measuring the distance between individuals, for example, in, in the question of um, pass, uh, passing COVID infection, then aggregation makes more sense. And if density is important, then masking makes more sense. So the research questions can really dictate how we protect privacy. Now from this, of course, we make inferences and we make conclusions, we draw conclusions from geospatial data. And that follows, using, uh, follows the use of various forms of analysis. And so I wanna explore that a little bit and explore particularly the ethical issues. So the ethical issues might be, for example, the bias resulting from preconceived ideas or the errors resulting from false inferences or inappropriate inferences. And to look at this, I'd like to uh, go into, a, a, very briefly into a marketing example. This is uh, from Rick Church, a colleague of mine at Santa Barbara. And this is making a point, which I think is, is a really important point in, in the way we now have developed GIS. Um, this you may recognize is, is central Seattle. And those white dots represent the locations of customers of this company. And the company has three stores, which are the black dots on the map. And there is a competitor um, located down towards the bottom of the map. And my point is simply this, that anyone can make a map like that using the kinds of tools we have available. We have geocoding tools available on the web. We have software available on the web. Anyone can make this map. But what does this map tell us? And that's the important issue. What inferences could you draw from this map? And one big problem is that the map doesn't show the underlying population density. So you might conclude that a lot of people are customers in the lower left part of the map, um, but then you might say, but isn't that because there's simply a lot of people there? So essentially the, the point I'm making is that a map like that doesn't provide any inference. You can't really conclude anything from a map like that without the kinds of tools that GIS provides. And this is, of course, the Esri mantra from a couple of years ago. GIS allows you to see what others can't. So let's explore that a little bit. And to do that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about cartographic ethics and the ethical issues involved in, in making maps. And there's this wonderful book, of course, by Mark Monmonier, which is now in its third edition, How to Lie with Maps, with some wonderful examples. And Esri has been exploring this um, quite a lot in the last few years, 
The map maker's mantra is a very nice uh, piece. And um, <clears throat> one issue which I've always um, thought a lot about is the issue of class interval selection. So when you make a map, like the map I showed of uh, New Orleans a few moments ago, when you make a map, typically you select class intervals and you assign colors or shading to each class. And uh, 50 years ago, Waldo Tobler, my, one of my colleagues at Santa Barbara, published a paper in which he said, now that we have computers, we don't need, in fact, to define classes. We don't need to bin data into classes because we can use the computer to create, to create continuous shading of color, continuous um, differences of, of um, cross, cross hatching. So he advocated what he called choropleth maps without class intervals and arguing that um, it was unethical for a scientist to bin data before mapping it because that distorted the data. Now, a cartographer, of course, would argue the opposite, that binning the data like that allows the map to, um, to capture a particular perspective, which is the perspective that the cartographer desires. Um, so this is very much an art versus science argument. Um, and it's always amazed me how little um, attention Tobler's idea got um, it's only recently that GIS Pro has, in fact, included this as an option. <clears throat> so let's let's come to an example. This is um, the city of Wuhan in China. Um, this is a map published by the New York Times uh, a year ago, showing early cases of COVID, and the central point in that um, cluster is the location of the market, which has often been cited as the origin of the outbreak of COVID. And visually, um, spatially, you might make the obvious inference that this pattern of early cases supports the hypothesis that it was the market that was responsible for the outbreak. And that, of course, today remains uh, an enormously contentious issue and a highly politicized issue. Um, but it is, in fact, an echo of something that we've talked about and taught about for decades in GIS, which is this, the work of Dr. John Snow in London in 1854, a, a, um, an analysis of an outbreak of cholera, which occurred in the Soho area of London. And uh, I'm sure you've, you've, um, you're aware of this example, I've thought about it, um, but let's explore it from the point of view of making inferences from geospatial analysis and geospatial data. So <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna replace the map with this one. It's a bit easier to see. So here, the, this is actually the historic, um, street pattern of Soho at that time. And the red triangles are the sources of water, drinking water. And the green dots are the locations of the deaths. And we would notice, of course, that the green dots appear to be clustered around one particular uh, water supply source in Broad Street is a pump. And we might also notice that um, there were deaths occurring um, in locations which were closer to other water supply sources. And Dr. John Snow, who lived in Golden Square at the bottom of the map, um, conducted interviews and um, uh, was able to document that many of those people had in fact got their water from Broad Street and not from the closer pump. And so this appeared to be strong support for his hypothesis that it was the drinking water that, that transmitted cholera. And as a result, he was able to go to the pump and disable it. And as a result, the outbreak died out. But let's think about this in terms of inferences being drawn from geospatial data. 
because there are four possible processes which might account for this pattern. So number one is the one that was widely believed at the time, which is that cholera was passed by bad air, by a high population density, narrow, badly ventilated streets, which allowed for the transmission of the whatever it was that caused the, the cholera. Alternatively, there might be contagion. So there might have been a single carrier located at the center of the outbreak who passed the disease to initially to neighbors and then spreading outwards to create the, the larger pattern. And in fact, we could resolve that, case, that um, issue if we had the dates of each death because then we could, using GIS, we could create a dynamic visualization of the disease spreading outwards. And it might be that this cluster resulted because there was something about the population in the Soho area that predisposed them to the disease. <coughs> so these might have, might have been a concentration of elderly people or children or a compromised immune system, people with a compromised immune system. And we could then compute rates of infection using the count of predisposed people as the denominator. In other words, we would normalize the data. That, of course, wasn't possible at the time. Um, we didn't have that kind of socioeconomic information. And so the fourth, the uh, water supply, was in fact, uh, did turn out to be the correct interpretation. And it was Snow's action in disabling the pump. In other words, taking control of the experiment that allowed that hypothesis to, to um, register as, as the correct one. So here's the pump. And if you go there today, the street network has changed partly because of World War II. And, um, this is a replica of the pump. It's not actually in the correct location. It's almost in the correct location. It is right outside the John Snow public house. And if you go into the pub, um, you can have a, um, uh, you can buy a t-shirt. And uh, Dr. John Snow these days is recognized as the, the father of epidemiology. And this incident as the reason why London uh, vastly improved its drinking water and its sanitary uh, sewer system. So Snow picked his preferred inference because he took control of the experiment. And these days in public health, that kind of action is virtually impossible. Uh, to pass the ethics reviews that would have to occur. Um, and we might also ask whether Snow actually explored the other options adequately. And one key issue here, and this is the principle really that's, that's behind all this, is the principle of equifinality, which says there will always be many processes that can account for the same spatial pattern. So in a field like GIS, where we rely on making inferences from spatial patterns all the time, this is a persistent difficulty. And it's a difficulty which Snow resolved, but usually is not possible uh, for us to resolve anymore. So always bear in mind that there can be multiple processes that would explain the same pattern uh, and avoid therefore the, the possibility that your, your conclusion was preconceived. So that's one principle. And there are in fact other principles that impact inference. And I'd just like to briefly review them um, number one is the ecological fallacy. And unfortunately, this is really badly named because ecology these days has come to mean environment. Uh, this is an older meaning of the, the word ecological, uh, which refers to aggregated data. So what's happening here is you discover some correlation at an aggregate level. So some correlation between things that you know about counties or things that you know about census tracts. And the fallacy is to assume that that correlation applies to the individual. 
So it's a correlation at the aggregate level. And for example, suppose that COVID infection, you find it to be correlated with percent Asian at the census tract level. The fallacy is then to, to conclude that individual Asians are more susceptible to COVID infection because that does not follow. So this is something that right now, a GIS interface doesn't help you with. So one possibility would be to suggest that the GIS user interface might pop up a message. It looks like you're headed to examine the correlation between two variables at an aggregate level. Be careful not to make a, an ecological fallacy. And of course, there would be a button that allows you to switch that message off and not see it again. Um, but it would at least warn you um, that this is, you're heading potentially into an ethical minefield. Here's another one, the causal fallacy. Correlation at the aggregate level does not imply causation. So this is something that's necessary to be very careful about because we have all sorts of words which imply cause. So when we say A explains B or A impacts B, we're implying cause. We're implying that A causes B. So something to, to be very careful about and avoid very carefully. So just briefly then, um, this question of generalizing across space and time, uh, what is found to apply in one area at one time does not necessarily apply to all areas at all times. And this is, again, it's a, a principle that underlies all of GIS analysis. And it's the principle of spatial heterogeneity. The various parts of the world may sometimes look similar, but they are not the same. So what happens in one part of the world doesn't necessarily happen in other parts of the world. If you're a geographer, I, I'm sure you're familiar with an age old issue in geography, which is this one. Is geography about discovering things that are true everywhere at all times? Or is it only about discovering unique things about places? And the technical terms here would be nomothetic versus ideographic. So I tend to like the last option here, which is what I'm calling weak replicability, which says that when you compare two areas or two times, some of your conclusions will apply in both places at both times. Other conclusions may not. And that's what we're developing in what is developing into the field of place-based analysis that recognizes the possibility of heterogeneity. And um, geographically weighted regression is a very popular technique now um, that reflects this, that looks for some things to say the same as you move across the world and some things to be different. And uncertainty. And uncertainty is a topic that I've been working on for decades and published a lot of papers and books. And it is something that, that again, is part of all spatial analysis and something that has to be always in our minds. So the basic principle here is that all geospatial data are uncertain to some degree. And as a result, it's therefore unethical to ignore uncertainty, to present results as if they were exact and perfect when knowing that in fact they're not. So even the measurement of location is always uncertain. It's impossible to measure location on the Earth's surface perfectly. We might do it to a meter, we might do it to a millimeter, but it's still not perfect. And so there will be variation because of that form of uncertainty. But there are other kinds of uncertainty which are in many cases more significant, such as the uncertainty over things like soil maps or land cover maps or land use maps. If you were to take two expert soil scientists 
and asked them to make a map of the same area, the results would not be the same. In other words, the very act of soil mapping is not replicable in a scientific sense. And what's more, uncertainty in data will propagate through analysis and lead to uncertain results. And perhaps most problematic here is that getting the uncertainty message across visually is extremely difficult. Um, it's people don't look at a map and think that it, it conveys uncertainty. Um, they like their maps to be perfect. They like maps to give a single clear message. Mapping techniques tend not to address uncertainty. So obvious options like blurring or graying or shaking usually get misinterpreted. And there are many, many examples of, of this across the field. So here's just a little example. Um, this is seven different data sets, each of them representing the streets of a particular part of Santa Barbara. This is the intersection between US Highway 101 and California Highway 217. And all seven are of course different because they're all subject to uncertainty. But what is I think most interesting about this is that while the positions of the streets have been shifted from one example to one data set to another, the shapes have not. The shapes are generally correct, or at least more correct. And this is why when you use a GPS navigator in a car, you see only one of these, you don't question its uncertainty. But if you were to overlay more than one source of data, you would see this kind of pattern. So it's a very pervasive problem throughout GIS. And then my final issue is repurposing GIS. And this I said earlier is one of, to my mind, one of the most serious ethical issues in this whole field. The GIS industry provides the tools, great. Um, first versions of ArcGIS back in the, or ArcInfo back in the 1980s had maybe 10 functions, 10 tools. Now ArcGIS Pro has approximately 10,000 tools. And it's left up to the user. The user interface is designed so that it's up to the user to ensure that the uses are, in, are, are ethical. This then allows repurposing. It allows a GIS design, device for urban planning to be repurposed for surveillance, to go from ethically a good use to what may be ethically a very sinister use. And so I think one of the research questions, um, and I talked briefly about the need for a research agenda here, a research question is, could the user interface be redesigned to address this and other ethical issues? And I suggested one very simple way of thinking about that with pop-up windows. It looks like you're getting into an area where there are some ethical questions, so be careful and click this button to find out more about this issue or click this button to turn this window off. That sort of thing, I think, would greatly improve our ability to deal with ethical issues, GIS. And then just briefly, the DEI issue, um, because it is clear that almost all of geotechnology was developed by white males, that very few women were involved prior to 1990. And so if Roger Tomlinson is acknowledged to be the father of GIS, then who was the mother? And what would an indigenous GIS look like? And these are, I think, very open and very interesting research question. So just to summarize uh, a few takeaway points. Um, uh, number one, Ethics needs to pervade all aspects of GIS practice. All too often, what we tend to do is to deal with ethics as the last chapter in the book, or the last lecture in the course, or perhaps the first lecture and the last lecture. Um, but 
in principle, ethics should be part of everything, should be ingrained in everything we do. So the ethical questions should be things that are constantly being asked. And then ethical issues are a vast canvas. I've talked about some personal favorites, essentially, in this, um, this talk. Um, they extend far beyond what people have often talked about as, as the geo privacy issue. Um, they extend into things like repurposing and inferences. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the ethical issues can only be resolved by the user. There is no possibility that we will be, be able to develop an ethical GIS, which takes care, of, takes care of all the ethical issues for us and relieves us of that particular worry. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been interesting. Um, be certainly welcome any uh, comments or questions. And um, uh, you're very welcome to uh, send me email if there are any issues you'd like to explore on a one-to-one -one basis. And uh, look forward very much to, to hearing from you. Thank you. Definitely. Thank, thank you very much. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, we definitely have some questions in the chat window. And Ali, if you want to help me, we can read these off here. I believe there's a there's a couple questions. Sure thing. Um, um, there's one here from Angel uh, Kostfischer. Um, he says or asks, um, the European law on cookies are much more restrictive than the US. Can you comment on the restriction on cookies in the USA? Yeah, I, I think um, you're right. And it's not just in cookies, it's it's in uh, the whole area of um, protection of privacy and confidentiality. Um, there are some instances now at the state level. Um, so California has moved forward somewhat. Um, the state of Washington looks like doing so um, with a new law that was passed um, a month ago. Um, so it will probably come down to the um, state level. Um, <clears throat> it is, though, a huge issue um, because there is uh, there are all sorts of uh, reasons why the U.S. has lagged behind, and one certainly is the um, the size of the industry involved, and therefore the lobbying. Um, so. I referred to the hundred odd companies that are now working in this area of assembling and reselling ping data, um, getting them to agree to restrictions is going to require some very careful negotiation. Um, <clears throat> then of course, there's, um, there's the other extreme, which is China, um, where surveillance and, um, is, is massively important in the way China operates. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Well, we have a, let's see here. Nathan has actually given a pretty long question oh. here for you, for you, Mike, uh, Dr. Uh, Goodchild. And so uh, not sure if I'm gonna read it off here, but uh, maybe, um, I guess it's uh, my view that is one of the best responsibilities and key skills of a GIS professional uh, to understand the potential problems with geospatial data and problems with inferences. Using the Wuhan market example, my immediate thought was, what if the population density around the market with lots of dots was much higher than the population density near the outline dots? And he's got a multiple part questions here, so I'll continue yeah. reading. Yep. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, I was very disappointed that um, the data had not been normalized. Um, I think uh, it'd be worthwhile you're going back to that article. Um, the link was in the presentation. Um, <clears throat> because the New York Times did document a lot about the provenance of the data and the methods that were used. I think probably in anticipation of the um, uh, the kinds of questions that, that would be asked. Um, so it, it would be worth going back. Um, normalizing by uh, population density, 
um, I think yes is is kind of essential, uh, but also knowing what locations were registered, and this is a, an important issue um, because um, deaths in a in a health context. Um, uh, data is often registered, uh, sometimes with the hospital, sometimes with the household, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of issues of provenance. Um, and then underlying it all is the political issue um, that uh, certainly there are established positions on this issue. And there are plenty of people who will be um, uh, willing to attack uh, whatever conclusions are made. So yeah, I, I I I was disappointed it wasn't normalized, but at the same time I think that um, uh, there would be a question of of how to normalize normalize by what total population, or by some kind of population at risk, or perhaps by by an age group. So lots could be done with that kind of thing. Well, we have a couple more here. Let me go ahead and read off to Tim Nolan's one. Uh, <laughs> Tim's, there's a joke out there that your analysis is simply a population density. You know, you know, what is our responsibility as professionals to point that out or asking the analyst to go deeper? Um, oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think that, uh, well, our, our responsibility is both. Um, we we need to point things out, but at the same time, we need to show that something better is possible. And um, there are many, many ways in which we can do that. Um, there's, and, and many pitfalls along the way. I mean, one pitfall I didn't mention is the, um, what's, traditionally been known as the modifiable error unit problem, or uh, what I've been advocating uh, as the open shore effect, which is the impact of the boundaries, the, unit, the spatial unit boundaries on the normalization. Um, so yes, if you wanted to normalize by population density, that's great, but over what areas do you evaluate population density? and the boundaries of the areas that you choose are going to impact the results. So normalizing by um, population per county, it's gonna give you different answers to normalizing by population by, by um, <clears throat> census tract. Um, so yes, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of hazards along the way, and it's our responsibility, I think, to show that we can navigate through those hazards and produce results that are um, viable and, and interesting. Um, <clears throat> so yes, yes to both. Right? Yes to pointing out the, um, the difficulties, but also yes to doing better. Very nice. I know early on before we started the, the presentation today, we, we talked briefly on the AI subject and uh, you know um, I know a lot of companies are starting to take this up as a policy of how to implement AI especially with using AI to, to uh, alter a, a, a map or an imagery let's say yes. that was collected could you briefly touch on that or, or is there any type of I know we're almost at time but maybe some some information or, or uh, um, white papers or something like that you can point us to yeah and I, th I think um the first thing to do is to get away from AI, the, the assumption that AI is a single massive enterprise, um, because within it, there are many different uh, little areas. And if we think only of geo AI, in other words, the use of AI to solve geographic problems, still there are many kinds of geo AI. And to talk, I think responsibly about ethics, we need to do that. We need to break this down into pieces. So one piece is classification. Um, the use of AI to create um, classes and then to predict. So um, 
uh, creating classes, for example, of um, risk for flooding, and using those classes then to to predict um, and to uh, create public policy. Um, in doing that, one of the ethical issues that arises is bias. It's basing our classes on samples that aren't necessarily representative samples. Um, basing our analysis on, uh, let's say, analysis of, let's say, use of facial recognition technology, um, and realizing that that technology has been developed using a sample of faces which exclude various kinds of faces, um, uh, faces of um, uh, Asians, for example, uh, ethical differences, um, racial differences. So that's just one example of where one type of application of AI gets us into ethical difficulties. Um, another type is the fact that um, AI, a lot of AI applications are not transparent. So this is taking us into the world of the black box, um, science in a black box, science doing things to data that we don't fully document and don't fully understand. So publish a paper that says, I used this particular kind of AI to, to do this analysis, but what I did is so complex that I can't really tell you. Um, and then um, perhaps just one last example. Um, uh, AI is very good often at predicting, um, but there's a, of course a major difference between predicting and explaining. And um, so there's a lot of work going on in the area of explainability of AI. Um, does AI require us to forget everything we know and just rely on the data? Or are the ways of taking what we know about the geographic world and using that knowledge to improve AI? And so this is a, a major topic for research in, in geo-AI how to take what we know about the geographic world. Uh, for example, the, the principle of spatial heterogeneity and using it to improve the work uh, rather than going back to the data and saying, we must forget everything we know already and just rely on the data. So this is the um, what's often talked about as, as letting the data speak for themselves. And one difficulty with that is that um, we tend to know a lot already as a result of decades of analysis. And it would be a mistake, I think, to ignore what we already know. So lots of ethical issues. And to get at them, I think the first thing we have to do is to break up AI into its different applications, its different pieces. Um, uh, and. Um, to do the same, of course, with, with geo AI. Well, thank you very, very much. I know we're a couple minutes over, and Dr. Goodchild, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us, and we'd love to have you back in the future if, if, uh, you're, if you're oh so willing. And sure. uh, I think I saw we had uh, 86, 87 uh, max today. Uh, that's That's pretty great. Uh, we have one person, uh, I think the farthest one was in Auckland and uh, was in Australia. So we, people all over from Carolina yeah. to Canada, but we definitely enjoyed it. What what we really should be doing, which we can, is um, continuing this conversation, um, going to the pub or going to the coffee bar. But unfortunately, well, Zoom doesn't let us do that. It doesn't. We, we might have to arrange maybe a... a Lady, late evening roundtable discussion, and we've done yeah. that before. So if you're open, that would be, we sure. definitely could probably pull it off. So, but, well, sure. thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll see everybody again next month. Uh, uh, Dr. Goodchild, uh, have fun with your gardening. And, uh, you. <laughs> and uh, if you have any more questions, uh, go ahead and send them to us. We'll get them uh, passed along to Dr. Goodchild. And um, yeah. uh, otherwise, we will see you all 
next month. Uh, the recording of this will be put up to our YouTube channel very, very soon. So again, thank you all. And uh, to my co-host, uh, uh, Ollie Powers. So uh, I'm Brian King, and we really appreciate it, uh, you attending the Eurasia Texas Speaker Series. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you.